Good morning and praise the Lord. It's a new day and probably full of new challenges. But with God's grace, all things are possible. Amen. And that's what we are trusting in today, that as we look into God's holy word and God speaks to us about what he's trying to show us from his word so it can help us in our journey. Well, as you know, we've been traveling, those who've been watching, we've been traveling and looking at this subject of holy and holiness. And we probably got today or tomorrow yet to go through the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. And then we'll be moving on to the New Testament, where we've shared how often now, when you look at the word holy in the New Testament, is most often linked to the Holy Spirit. And so, but today, as we continue on our journey, and thank you for joining us, we're going to go to Obadiah. Probably Obadiah is, you know, one of the smallest books in a sense, because it only has one chapter. I guess it would be equal to probably Jude that only has one chapter. I mean, there's several books in the Bible that only have one chapter to them. Third John would be another one. And so here Obadiah is used by God to give a prophetic word again to the people of Israel, but also to another group of people. Obadiah his name means worshiper of Yahweh or a servant of Yahweh. However, you know, it's kind of, you want to translate it. But even as a worshiper and servant of Yahweh, he has got something to say when it comes to the people of Israel and to the people around about. And Obadiah is used by God, as it were, to speak judgment against the Edomites. Now, you may wonder, who are the Edomites? <laughs> All these mites that are wandering around <laughs> outside of Israel and inside of Israel. But the Edomites, if you remember, you go back and you have Esau and Jacob. Remember that there was a division. Jacob took the birthright from Esau and then there was a division. They were apart from each other for years and years and years. And then finally, Jacob comes back to the land of Israel and uh, deals with a lot of the things that were going on between him and his brother. Well, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. Okay, so now you got Esau, the Edomites, and you got... Jacob, the Israelis, or people, as you could sort of say, the Israelites. <laughs> it seems like an awkward word, but that's how we get this, this description that's going on here between the two groups. And Obadiah is going to speak uh, to these Edomites about what they had done and not done, and how also how they abused the holiness of God, the holiness of his uh, tabernacle and temple, I guess would be the best word to say, his presence. And uh, when I was reflecting on this this morning a little bit more, you know, we're talking about a, a fairly long period of time from Jacob and Esau to the present. And... Uh, the history of this, as it goes back, you can go back to Numbers chapter 20, when the, uh, the Edomites were stubborn in their refusal to help Israel when they were in the wilderness, as they were wandering through the wilderness. And then later on, there was another time that they had an opportunity uh, during an invasion where they could have helped, but they would not. And so because of that, there is now judgment coming upon them and so as we think about this uh, as I was reflecting about it I just thought about when things aren't dealt with God still remembers and as he remembers he also takes time to reveal to give 
you know, when we don't deal with sin or some of the things in our life, God remembers. It's not blotted out yet. And because it's not blotted out, somewhere along the line, it reveals itself. Now, I don't know if I want to read how much I want to read into all this, but this is kind of like what came to me as I was praying about this morning, is that these are things that were going on, of course, when it was in the wilderness, and then afterwards when the invasion, when Joshua was there, and then now at this time, we got uh, all kinds of corrupt things going on by the Edomites too. And so God remembers, and then God reveals to Obadiah what has happened and now judgment is going to come upon them and so we got all these generations you know and sometimes uh Colin and I have talked a lot about this over the years about how things get passed on from generation to generation and sometimes generations down the road don't know what has happened in previous generations, but often sometimes they will reap the consequences of things that have gone on with their fathers and forefathers. That's why we need to be praying and asking forgiveness, not only for ourselves, but for our family, and that anything that is linked to previous generations be broken in the name of Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? And so, we see a little bit of this going on here because we're, as I say, we're, we're looking at hundreds of years later from this, this problem with Esau and Jacob, and it's still there. And it's amazing how you can have things and that are hundreds of years old and how they are still with many people as relevant today as they were hundreds of years ago. We got this going on in our country and many countries around the world that where they're dealing with history that most people thought, well, it's forgotten and uh, we've put it aside and no one's going to remember it anymore. And then all of a sudden, there it is. And so when I was reading, up, thinking about Obadiah, I thought, Wow, how things are, are not only uh, current to what we are facing in many countries around the world, but how things and, and hatred and animosity can go back generation after generation after generation. I don't know, as I said, I don't want to read a whole lot into it, but I think that's why, you know, there needs to be the confessing of sin. There needs to be making things right. And because if they're not dealt with, somewhere along the line, they get remembered and then they get revealed. Does that make any sense to you at all today? Because I think it's important because it's, it's kind of a background thing that the Lord was laying on my heart. Because I've been asking the Lord, you know, all this week and, and uh, even before, I want to know the relevancy of some of these uh, books, how they are, are relevant to today. Because I don't believe God keeps something and, and looks after it and, and watches over something that is written for thousands of years where it could have been destroyed, could have been lost. All these books, uh, and I've been reflecting a lot on the book of Jonah. I mean, you know, many people just think Jonah as a story. But here, you know, we got Obadiah, and most people probably have never even heard of Obadiah or even heard a sermon of, on the book of Obadiah. But Obadiah, again, is, is going to bring forth that you no know, matter how long things have been, they are remembered if they're not confessed, they're not blotted out, and they will be revealed somewhere along the line. That's why confession is so important. And not only that, that if they're not dealt with, they, they continue to become a root of, of terribleness in the house of God. And so that's why we come to our verses 
here in verse 15 and 16, where it's talking about the Edomites and what they were doing and how uh, how they have brought about uh, dishonor and filthiness and all kinds of things to the holy mountain of God. He says here in verse 15, For the day of the Lord is upon all the nations is near. So again, we hear a, a, a prophetic word that there is judgment coming, the day of the Lord, which means judgment, means there's going to be a time of reconciling for passing. It's just like, you know, Jesus uses this several times in the prophet or in the parables in the New Testament, talking about, you know, as as the landlord goes away or as the king goes away, but he goes away and in some time, unknown time, he comes back again and there is a a reckoning of what people have done and not done. And so it is here, Obadiah is saying, hey, the, the, the day of the Lord is near. And you Edomites and Israel, you need to deal with some of the things that are going on. So I'm asking the Lord, how does this, how, how do we get a hold of these little uh, minor prophet books and how do they relate to me as a disciple and to the church today? Are they just references? Are they just stories? Are they just illustrations? Or are they the word of God to us today with similar things that are going on today as they were going on then? That's what I've been reflecting on. And when you reflect on that, it becomes a little bit scary. Because all of a sudden you see there is a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities between uh, how the people of God treated God back then and how the people of God respond and treat God today. So we see here, For the day of the Lord is upon all the nations is near, and all you have done, it shall be done to you. You know, again, whatever you sow, as Paul says, you will reap. And so that's why I thought about this whole idea that if sin is not blotted out, there will be a time of an accounting. And that's, isn't it sound familiar to what Paul says? As you have done, it shall be done to you. You know, uh, I mean, Jesus talks about positive sides this. Wherever you sow, you shall reap and you can reap blessings. But wherever you sow and you and, and uh, sow evil, you will reap evil. And so... Your reprisal shall turn upon your own head. So this is what Obadiah is saying to the Edomites. So this is what's coming down the tube your way. And you need to see this. He goes on in verse 16. And this is where the only time we get the word holy is used. But he uses it as to describe what they're doing. For as you drank on my holy mountain. So shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they have never been. You know, in our day, day and age, you get this idea of drinking usually means to party on. It means to, you know, uh, numb our senses and hopefully not expect anything. You know, that's why people drink. That's why I, when, before I became a Christian, I drank because it would numb my senses. It would, you know, help me to not have anxiety and stress and not to remember the things of the past. Um, I had alcoholism in my family and uh, I know that it's a problem. And so here they were going to the holy mountain where they should be going to worship God. And instead of that, they were drinking and, as you could probably assume, partying and acting like God was not around at all. And they were doing this on the holy mountain where God's place, his presence was to be. And this is what they were doing. And 
he's going to, Obadiah is going to show them that you Edomites, you think you have one out, but there's a time coming and we get from verses 17 to 21 where Israel will finally triumph over them. There's going to be a triumphant victory. But that's why I say there's an accounting, there's a revealing, and there's going to be a judgment. And if it's not dealt with, it's going to be dealt with. God will deal with it. And so I would think as we look at that today, how much similarities that we're trying to hide from our history, to numb ourselves with alcohol and to do different things. Now we've got drugs and all kinds of other things that help us to numb and to, and not to hear the voice of God anymore. But Obadiah was saying, you need to hear today, you Edomites, that there is a judgment day coming. The day of the Lord is coming. And all things are going to be remembered for how you treated Israel. And all things will be brought into account. And there will be accounting by a holy judge. Does that not sound a lot of, like the New Testament? Does that not sound like what Jesus was telling the people of Israel? Does that not sound like what you know John was going to tell through a revelation to the people of the world? Because you hear, he's not just saying, you know, you drank on my holy mountain, you Edomites. But he goes back and he talks about the nations. How the day of the Lord is coming upon the nations. So every nation, I guess we could say, has got skeletons in the closet. Every nation has done things. And if we don't deal with them as nations, and if we don't deal with them as a people, we may experience some of these things come back, as we would say in English, come back to haunt us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's something to think about when we look at Obadiah. Well, then we're going to move on to Jonah. Well, Jonah, I guess you could say, is uh, probably a testimony of, a, of how God wanted to send somebody on a mission trip to go to a wicked city, to a city of Nineveh, and again, it was known for very a great amount of wickedness. And Nineveh is way up. Uh, it's actually up in the same, around the same area where Abraham came from. So we're talking years and years before. It's on the, on the uh, um, I was just going to say Tiberius River, if I pronounce it right. Let me just see here the name of the river. Tigris, sorry. Tigris River. It's way up there. And and because it's up there, you know, God is going to say to Jonah, I want you to go up there and speak against the city. It's a very big city. Huge population. And they're very wicked. And uh, they have been in power in that. And now God is going to bring about judgment on Nineveh. And it's interesting, though, as we look at the book of Jonah, there is a need for not only Jonah, but others to understand how God works. God is a just God. And I think we can see here from Jonah, like the name Jonah means dove. You can imagine that to, to one who flies. I don't know if you know about morning doves. We have lots of them around here. We had a whole bunch of them here the other day. They're peaceful and they're quiet. And so here, here we got this missionary going out and uh, thinking these people deserve judgment. Matter of fact, he, he, he finally is willing to go hoping that he could get a, a side seat <laughs> somewhere out in the, just outside the city and watch judgment fall upon the city. And you know, I've had to struggle with some of that stuff as a missionary. I've gone into different countries and I've seen what people, groups, have done to other people groups. 
And I remember God asking me one time when I was struggling, I won't give the names of the different people groups, things that they had done during the Second World War, things that they had done after the Second World War, how other people groups had done and atrocities to other people groups and and how many of these other groups persecuted and uh, harassed and even shed blood of Christians. And I'm thinking of, uh, you know, these people and I'm and I'm almost like wanting to sit back on the sidelines and say, OK, God, get them for what they have done. And so, you know, when we talk about the relevancy of these Old Testament prophets, it's very relevant today. What would we say when we look at a nation that's around about that is wicked? Are we saying, Lord, get them. Let your judgment fall. Or are we willing to be like God's character and through repentance, when yeah. people repent, that God would show mercy upon them. So I remember it as I was telling you that I was I was in this country and dealing with some of these same kind of issues. And God just one day said to me, but Jim, if I was to save them and that they would be in heaven, even after all that they did, to some of the people you know, would you rejoice and be glad in it? Or would you be angry at me? And I remember that day saying, no, Lord, you know, I don't understand all things, but I know that your love is great and your mercy is just. And Lord, I would even like to see some of these people in heaven. In fact, all of them. Because we're all sinners saved by grace. And this was the issue that Jonah was having. You know, he was okay of, you know, speaking out here and speaking out there, the people of Israel and all over. The, now God was saying, Jonah, I want to take you over. You're going to have to go on a journey. And, you know, he tried to run and we know all the story. And, uh, he goes on and, and he almost has got an inkling that if I go and preach there, they're probably going to repent. And now the, the, the joy I was going to have watching them being destroyed. There's how many, how many was there that it is say here that Nineveh, the great city is more than a, a hundred and twenty thousand people. It took an, it almost took like a number of days to get across this, the width of this huge city. And so Jonah was saying, you know, get him, Lord. But what God wanted to show Jonah, that the purpose of sending him so that these people would have an opportunity to hear of the good news of God, their creator, and to repent and to be brought into a place of a relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? So we get this word holy shows up twice in chapter 2. And it's got to do as uh, Jonah is praying a prayer for deliverance for himself now. He's in the he's inside the belly of this large fish. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he's trying to take off. And we're going to see here that not only did the, the ship crew get spared, but Jonah gets spared. And the uniqueness about it, the city of Nineveh gets spared. But while he's in, has a time to reflect, three days. And of course, Jesus talks about this book of Jonah. And he said, just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so shall I be in the belly or in the bowels of the earth. And so here, as Jonah is reflecting, he says in verse 4, Then I said, I have cast out of your sight. I have been cast out of your sight. Jonah figures, you know, I'm in the belly of this fish. God, you have left me and you don't see me no more. Which is wrong. God sees all things, knows all things, and knows exactly where we are. Whether we pull the blinds, turn all the lights off, or whatever we do to hide our sin, he sees it and knows it, okay, and records it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he said, 
Then I said, I have been cast out from your sight, yet I look again towards your holy temple. He's saying, Lord, I, I have been disobedient. I have gone in the wrong direction. But now, Lord, I'm in the, the belly of the fish. I don't know what to do and what to say. But what I think I should do and say, and what he reflects on doing and saying, is that he looks to God's holy temple. Or to put it another way, he just looks to God's presence again. And he knows he's blown it. He knows that he's not in tune to what God wants to do. And so he says, I look to your holy temple. And then in verse 7, he does it again. He says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. So this is the interesting thing about stubbornness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jonah was stubborn. Jonah gets angry. Jonah's upset. He's a prophet of God. And, you know, he's not thinking what he should be thinking. And so he looks to God, to his holy temple, reflects on the temple, the holiness of God, Jerusalem, the city of peace, all that. He's got in his mind and he's still reflecting. And he, now that he's almost feel like he's going to die and faint. I mean, it's probably two, you know, the second or third day he's inside the belly of this fish. And I don't know if you can picture what that might be. It was not going to the Holiday Inn or anything. Every piece of garbage and junk would be in there, all wrapping him up and all kinds of ugliness. And when he was about ready to faint, it says here, it says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm always, that makes me think about how often when people are dying and if they don't die swiftly, but let's say that, you know, there's, there's a week or two or a month before they know that the, the, the death sentence is on them. They know that their physical body is going to die. It's amazing. They start thinking about spiritual things. They start thinking about, okay, where is my life going to end up? Where am I going to end up spiritually? And so many pastors will tell you that a lot of people get led to the Lord that last few days and hours and weeks before that person dies. Because they're feeling faint in themselves. They, they know now there's nothing they can do to correct it or to deal with it other than to look to God. And to look to his presence, to ask for forgiveness, and God forgives. And it's interesting, as he was now looking, he said, My soul faints, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. So now he's he's at the bottom of the barrel, you could sort of say. He looks to the holy temple. He ushers a prayer probably a prayer of forgiveness and says to the Lord, you know, Lord, I've blown it. Can you even forgive me? You know, he's sent on a mission trip to bring, and we, and we, we don't go into it, but we'll uh, on another day, maybe go into it. But here he is brought to go on a mission trip to bring the good news of repentance to a wicked city and he's angry and doesn't want it to do because he's afraid that God's grace and God's mercy will be brought about. And what happens, we see uh, just towards the end where Jonah is still angry. And uh, I'm just not sure of the verse, but it talks about his grace and mercy. Yeah, in chapter 4, verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, what not that what as I said would when I was still in my country. Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundance in love and kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So Jonah has got it all in his mind. He says, and it's amazing. He knows who God is, but he won't go on the proper mission trip to tell the people that if you turn from your wicked and you repent, which they did. They repented. They had fasting and prayer, not only them, but the king, the animals, everybody else. And they all repent. And God shows his graciousness and his mercy and his loving kindness and forgives them. 
And that's what missions is all about, is to go out and to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And if people would just repent, there would be a cleansing, a washing, a forgiveness. There would be grace that would be poured out, mercy that would be poured out, and his love and kindness will be poured out. Isn't that amazing? And that's what it's all about. That's what we as disciples and believers and churches need to go out on missions to our communities, our neighbors, the those around about them, and even though they are in the midst of wickedness, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that a people will turn to him, that he is gracious, he is merciful, and he will show his loving kindness. That even when they deserve judgment, he will blot out their sins from the book. Now there is a real message to think about. That's our holy God. And we need to each day look to his holy presence, his holy temple, to him and ask him, give us wisdom, Lord. Give us the ability to know how to speak and what to say. For Lord, we just ask this all in your name. And that's what God wanted to show, that God was going to do something very powerful. And I believe all of those of you who are missionaries and evangelists and uh, teachers and preachers, you need to know that you've been called to God to take out a good news message out into the highways and byways so that people, because God has chosen to work through you to bring a message to them so that they can experience and know for themselves the graciousness and the mercy and the loving kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our holy God. That's one of his wonderful characters of who he is. That he's a God of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can learn from Obadiah and that we can learn from Jonah. And that these books are relevant for us today. How we view people. How we see those around about us. Oh God, help us to be those missionaries whether it's a missionary abroad or whether it's a missionary to our neighbor, that we would go forth not in, in trying to justify and say, oh, look at them. You should destroy them, Lord. You should wipe them off. But no, Lord, you want to show them the same graciousness and mercy and love and kindness as you showed us. Lord, you do not want anyone to end up in eternal destruction. You want all to have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So, oh God, I pray that we won't be Jonas who will choose to go another way or be Jonas who choose to have a heart full of anger towards other people groups and other nations. But you would use us to have, uh, to be a vessel of grace and mercy and love to all of those that you bring us in contact with. And we just give you thanks for what you're going to do in our lives now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I hope that that's kind of stirred you up inside like it stirred me up inside today. And feel free to leave a few comments. But I know that these little books, these little minor prophets are just as relevant today as they were thousands of years ago. And so we need to apply what they're saying into our lives today. And we'll watch and see God do great and mighty things. Amen. Love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Amen. Bye-bye for now.